Yeah, we are very happy also to take the opportunity now in the lecture uh, series to present uh, what we've been doing with the uh, uh, hybrid mapping. Um, we will talk uh, about refiguration and space-time drawing uh, tonight and um, try to illustrate um, somehow this development of, uh, of, of our interdisciplinary method uh, through this one uh, research project that we are conducting uh, about um, Berlin Botanical Garden. Um, yeah, we will come to that. So basically today uh, we will talk about the shortly actually introduce first uh, the, the theoretical frame that we are um, embedded into uh, the refiguration of spaces. Um, then uh, shortly talk about the methodology before uh, coming to this example. Um, since the, the 60s, uh, societies has, um, have experienced dramatic shift um, in their social orders. Uh, among the most serious of these changes are, and they will come surely as familiar uh, to your ears, um, the inten intensification of transnational economic activities, the ruptures in global political geography, the de development and spread of digital information and communication technologies, the increase in the global circulation of people, knowledge and good, or and the fracture of regional territorial identities. What we can uh, call as um, tecto tectonic shift in society and social life um, um, has led to a, a profound change in our experience, in our understanding and imagination of spaces. That is exactly what we called um, the refiguration of spaces um, on a global scale. Uh, scale um, that we actually uh, built on uh, the work of uh, two um, scholars, uh, Hubert Knobler and Martina Löw, who are uh, also at the head of the of, of this CSC we part, we're all part of. Um, we, refiguration describes a, a transformative process that is not attached, and that's uh, surely for our lecture series very important, not attached to a linear or progress orientated thinking. The, this change is not always for the best, it's, it is contested, it, is, um, it, got, um, it can got to get sidewards. Um, what is much more of interest for us in this refiguration theory is that is an, an, an attempt to grasp the conflict and tension produced by simultaneous and contradictory logic. So for example, on the one hand, we have this claim that the world is going fluid and open and dematerialized and so on. But at the same time, actually, we experience a re-territorialization with all the new borders, borders built and um, the different infrastructure in place. So that's exactly this kind of logic, like between deterritorialization and re-territorialization that um, is actually some, something that we're trying to grasp with the refiguration um, framework. Um, that is obviously a very broad frame uh, in which we are, so a proper space-time reflection. Um, before going further, we would like to give a very short definition of what we mean with space-time and space-time. Um, we understand space as relational um, in the definition of Martin Leleuve or Dorian Messi. Um, that is, uh, space is not a container, obviously. It unfolds through the praxis of um, an assemblage of different goods and actors. Indeed, it's not only an arrangement, it's activated through the action and given meaning through the recognition of this space as such. Um, we, we see two, three dimensions that we consider very important. And they are important because then it's, I mean, that they, they are the dimension that we try to grasp through the mapping. Um, space is multiple, um, space is processual or dynamic, and space is multiscalar. So we really, the, we really try to actually think space yeah, already through time and through actually different scale. To think the multiplicity of space, um, we consider the um, uh, heur heuristic uh, quite useful, the heuristic of the, of the special figures. That is, space doesn't take only the, the shape of the territory following the logic of bordering. That would be obviously the 
must the major somehow special definition that we inherited from the modern, but it can also take the shape of a network following much more logic of association or the, um, the figure of a place um, that is following much more logic of overlay or the figure of trajectory that is um, actually stressing a, a logic of crossing through and can you you can see that actually with we are really trying to somehow yeah um, explode and make actually the, the this 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 special understanding um, more multiple and maybe more complex through these figures um, about time what um, we are um, drawing about uh, Naba Elias heritage um, with this uh, concept of um, process um, orientated sociology. So what is actually, because the figuration concept is actually coming from Norbert Elias and it's um, very much this idea that um, that somehow um, the, um, the, the change of societies, it is a normal state and the relative staying of society in a certain state as an expression of the blocking of change is actually something that is extraordinary. So it's really trying to reverse maybe um, on otherwise a common thinking that um, everything is fixed and sometimes up in a change. It's more, much more the way around. Actually, it's changes happening all the time and sometimes things got fixed and that is then quite exciting to try to understand why. Um, so we are interested in this critical juncture from, from the 60s, as I said, because that's a kind of very important temporal moment for, for the refiguration. Um, and uh, we see the refiguration theory as an alternative to this, actually to the sequentiality that we often think um, between modernity and postmodernity. Um, much more actually the refiguration theory want to throw a light on the conflict between the two understanding. Um, despite this um, periodization from the 60s and because we are trying um, to seriously think processes, we are keen of reflect on reflecting um, or maybe de or reconstructing the concept of temporalities. So time is not something um, to take for granted. Time is constructed also through our own research agenda, right? Um, so as a as a certain periodization, as an event, as um, his stories or stories, um, and possibly, obviously, times coexist um, in these different shapes. Um, here we draw upon the thought of the Indian historian uh, Deepesh um, Chakrabarti, uh, when, for example, he says, um, living in the Anthropocene, um, means inhabiting two presents at the same time, the geolog geological time and the human world history time. Um, so that's exactly this kind of uh, thinking we try to, to unfold here. Um, and so obviously <laughs> with, and that's basically also the idea of the lecture series, but also in our work is, is, is this somehow shaped or um, um, carried maybe by this attempt to hold both complexities together, the one about space and the one about time. And it's difficult and overwhelming, but it's important um, not to take them for granted, but to investigate, we would call it maybe they as um, a situated entangled construction. Because um, yeah, when we think specially, we tend to see everything quite stable or stratified and straight, stressing the time dimension, put the changing dimension in the foreground uh, again. And it's exactly what we are looking uh, for as uh, we already asserted with um, Norbert Elias. Um, we will give you an example with our research on botanical garden in a moment, um, especially about the conservation logic, um, which uh, we understand as a stabilizing practices in a changing time. But first we want to introduce our method because yeah, it's um, what is really about tonight. Um, and it's come from the, from the consta obviously that such uh, theoretical expansion as the refiguration um, needs actually innovative method 
to empirically investigate this relationality and materiality of space um, and their change in, uh, in time. So that's uh, basically what we've, um, I mean, in September 2018, we started um, together um, a working group um, that we called hybrid mapping method. And um, we've, we found this uh, working group with the objective to develop um, a new hybrid mapping methodology at the interface of social science and spatial design, as I already said. So that's very on the intersection of this uh, disciplinary background architecture, sociology, and uh, planning, uh, mostly. Um, so the, the idea was that um, to bring together mapping tools from architecture and special design um, together with methodology from social science, or to put another way to combine the, the creativity of special design discipline with the reflexive processive of social scientific discipline. Um, Basically, this is what we see as um, the product of uh, design turn in, in social science, um, or what certain authors call it like this, and, and social turn maybe in the spatial science. So it's really trying to actually um, make this interdisciplinary constellation uh, fruitful. Um, we see four dimension. Um, so that's how we actually develop this uh, this method is um, we try to really think about um, hybrid or dim dimensions of hybridity that is somehow um, characterizing this hybrid map mapping method. Um, the first one and, um, is um, exactly what I just said is uh, inter and transdisciplinarity that um, explicitly refers to the combination of and epistemic and ontological approaches from social science um, and with special design. Um, the second dimension is, and we already also quite, um, I already tried to um, embrace it as um, actually addressing the um, um, an hybrid um, space-time concept. Um, so trying actually to really think um, space in, uh, in this multiplicity. Um, the third, and that's, and that's, actually, that's actually quite, I would say, the challenge in, in this mapping is not to fall back to the container as um, from the moment you begin to draw, but we will come to that. Um, the third dimension is actually to try to use uh, hybrid data, so um, not to get stuck to one type, but really considering the integration of the diverse data into um, a multi-layered visual analytical protocol. So saying, trying to use qualitative and quantitative data as a kind of mixed method approach, but also multimodal data where um, we can use text or um, images or numbers. Um, and the first dim dimension is, uh, is this kind of modus operandi where uh, we address, uh, in which we address the diverse methodological approach existing in, existing in each discipline. Um, that is not only to, yeah, to also use the design, designerly way of knowing um, as, um, as a, a, a very somehow, um, yeah, inspirational uh, tactic. Mm -hmm. um, so now we want to illustrate uh, what we've done with this mapping, so that we show you maps, um, and I give you the word. Thank you. So now I'm going to take over a little bit and talk to you about uh, the Botanic Gardens in Berlin, which is the project uh, that we're working on together, and we've been working on over the last three years, often with students, so it's a sort of teaching and research project. So some of the maps that you'll see in the coming slides have been drawn um, across different seminars with different groups of students. So, you know, we must credit them for, for their hard work as well and uh, for thinking with us together. Um, so, yeah, this has been an investigation from a socio-spatial perspective and the production of knowledge and the production of space at the Botanic Gardens in Berlin. Uh, the claim is that these institutions are, are undergoing profound transformations at the beginning of the 21st century. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we, we want to try and... Uh, yeah, I suppose grasp these this transformation 
of the gardens, of the botanic gardens as a, as a modern institution. And we've started to understand what this might be saying about other kind of larger processes, refigurational processes that are occurring, perhaps at a sort of uh, more of a, a societal level. So we, we end up thinking more about conservation or what it what conservation is kind of meaning or the new, perhaps the new role it's taking in the kind of Anthropocene. <clears throat> so the relevance of the research is, uh, as I started to kind of touch on, it's about um, this these, these examples of um of uh of, of modernist institutions whose mission traditionally has been about collecting and classifying and storing botanical knowledge um you know they're kind of they're, they're kind of multiplicity these spaces they 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 function as uh, typically they have functioned as scientific organizations they've functioned as cultural places where they're museums they have a display of knowledge they're about disseminating information and knowledge to the public and they're also kind of green spaces, they're recreational spaces where people come and they just take kind of refuge from the city. So they operate on these different levels. They're quite complex organizations. They're a multiplicity, right? But as we say, their role is being challenged. They're having to find new kind of legitimacy for their for their position. Um, and they're they're having to kind of yeah, re relocate themselves in this in this uh uh in this discussion of the Anthropocene, where you know the backdrop of this are you know one of the you know we have identified let's say three processes um which uh, our colleagues last week or two weeks ago in the and the feral atlas they talked about these processes detonators you know big large scale kind of processes that are affecting kind of global change so the three that we see are, are particularly important to the, the the change the process of transformation in the botanic gardens and perhaps in conservation um, is digitalization the increase in you know an increase in, in change in technology this is about pace of change it's also about high um, uh, degree of change this is changing practices across many different levels in, the, in their from scientific practices to uh, dissemination practices and storage of knowledge decolonization this is a process that's of course uh, within a certain time frame um, and I think it's it's becoming much more recognized these days about the kind of connection between plants, botany, botanic, even botanic institutions and uh, colonization and the networks of coloniality and how the exchange of plant matter and exchange of knowledge were um, were kind of facilitated through these colonial networks. Um, and then third major process is climate change. So as I've started to indicate this kind of the changing climate and specifically the kind of um, biodiversity loss this idea of mass extinction of species this is something that botanic gardens are well placed to 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 kind of uh, grapple with so the questions that kind of frame our research a larger scale are kind of we wanted to understand how is space constituted in the botanic gardens in berlin so we, we, this is the thing that over these next few slides we're going to try and unpack and in which ways is knowledge and power inscribed into these spaces so knowledge and, and it's this connection between knowledge power and space and how the and which ways these um spatial structures they become structured into the botanic gardens as a multiplicity of spaces um and how these structures are affecting processes of change are they destabilizing processes of change? are they interrupting processes of change so these are the kind of questions that we're grappling with so some of the data that we that we collected um to uh yeah to kind of facilitate this this uh, hybrid mapping exercise as, as severine has mentioned we try and um we, the, the point of this protocol the point of the hybrid mapping protocol is it's supposed to allow us to to grasp um, diverse hybrid data and try and locate them into this kind of joint spatial display of the maps which we'll see in a minute okay so just to give you a flavor of what we've been collecting that includes visual data so drawing sketching photos obviously coming from this kind of more design architecture, spatial planning kind of background, um, working with um, go-alongs and expert interviews, so much more in typical in social sciences, um, and then working with quantitative data coming from botanic data uh, databases about plant provenance, in this case, uh, about cacti. This is the kind of the, the, the particular species that we sort of honed in on here. Okay, so if we're talking about mapping space and change, you know, a very typical way of, of kind of addressing that in um, in uh, 
planning and design and architecture is to do these kind of drawings of the morphology of the city. Now, we're quite familiar. You see these drawings along the bottom of the screen where we might take a hundred year period and we might say, OK, well, the city was nothing but a potato field at one point in time. And then, of course, then something changed. The, the, the Botanic Gardens moved in in about 1910 to this corner of, uh, Z of uh, Zellendorf, this sort of southwest corner of uh, Berlin. Um, and then over time, um, the space adapted, changed, grew a little bit. You know, and this is a kind of this is a perfectly fine way of telling the story of of mapping somehow space, which often in this kind of way of characterizing is quite discreet. It tends to sort of be hard not to fall back into that kind of very uh, singular idea of space as a container. And time time tends to be linear. You now we tell this one story of time going forward, and it's progressive. And, you know, the question is, you know, how do we break, how do we get through that? How do we kind of break past that? Well, there's a, the line of time has just appeared. Okay, so this is what one of our results. This is a hybrid map of the, of the kind of um, the spatial structures of the glass house in the Botanic Gardens in Berlin. So this is the result. Now on the next slides, we try and break this down because it's clearly quite a complex map. Um, and the way that we do this, the kind of the way that the protocol that we follow in our hybrid mapping is to sort of deconstruct the space, to deconstruct space time. So this is a kind of this is definitely a hybrid te te technique or tactic or method where in architecture and planning, we're very used to kind of constructing space. We're very used to sort of unpicking and the layers of space. You know, it might be about infrastructure. It might be about green spaces. It might be about public spaces, nolly plans. These are familiar kind of ways of depicting particular Kind of arrangements of space obviously very usually very physical and material ideas of space um, in the city and but we're sort of flipping on its head and we start with the space that we want to understand here so we want to understand what the glass house is how is this arranged as you'll remember the research question how is the space of the glass house is constituted so we start with with, with the space and then we you know which seems kind of innocent and naive you walk into a, a botanic glass house it's a view, beautiful space it's quite warm you know, it's with glass, there's, you're surrounded by plants from different regions. It's very easy to kind of, you know, let it wash over you and think this is a, you know, a very innocent and wonderful space. But when we start to kind of analyze, well, how is this space constituted? We start to see what these layers are. So we come up, we came up our results with eight dimensions. That's climate zones, new and old world, taxonomy, social institutional networks, educational gestures and aesthetic gestures. So you can see it's kind of scalar, it's kind of crossing the scales. Um, and yeah, so, so this, uh, so these are the sort of maybe the first two logics we take together. We understand the kind of the, the climate and colonization or climate and, 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 uh, old and new world. So these are kind of primary ways that glass houses are organized. So you'll see in the bottom left-hand corner there, there's this world map, which you're recognized on the, the previous drawing. You know, and we understand that there's this kind of climatic zone. So Tony even mentioned earlier the kind of this this death line of the equator, which is of course extremely hot, and then you have these tropical zones either side of it. They represent certain climatic zones across the world. This is directly then translated into the glass houses. So you can see the green spaces in the glass houses correspond to green biomes, to particular biomes which are staged at the glass in in the global north. So we have this kind of north south geographic division already because these tend to be we're looking at cacti remember these tend to be um spaces that are from the global south biomes up, you know types of even nature somehow that are existing in the global south that are staged recreated maybe even mimicked in the north right and the other the second kind of logic here is the old and world new, old world and new world which is um which is very typical in botany as a way of organizing knowledge. This is that when we did interviews, when we sort of spoke to our um, interlocutors in at the, at the Botanic Gardens, it was very common for them to slip into this parlance of, of old and new world. And we were kind of slightly curious to understand what it means. And, um, and yeah, we sort of dug into that, but really needless to say too much about that at the moment, but it's definitely a way that you understand that the way that the plants are organized according to, to this, east-west axis so we have this kind of quite geographical translation of the globe into the glass house maybe there's the thing the other thing to say here is this kind of second point about time so this is 
already we're starting to sort of navigate and trying to sort of grapple with these two time frames the, the climate which is working on a geological time frame and colonization which is working in a particular form of world history so but we have to sort of you know as that as chakrabati talks about in in his recent book you know you have to we have to sort of learn to not reject one for the other he talks about the figures of the planet and the globe you know and and he asks us to you know to to be able to grapple with both of these things to be able to um and to be you know he talks about living in the anthropocene means being able to inhabit the these two presents at the same time. Like I find that a really compelling kind of challenge and idea. So we come to um, the next level, the next dimension of how these kind of plants are organized, how these glass houses are organized according to, to science and taxonomy. So it's maybe obvious, as I said earlier, these spaces are multiplicities, they are scientific organizations. Um, you know, they're there to collect these. This isn't just plants. These are data. These are kind of these are artifacts. These are collected. They're extracted from the natural world and immediately they're sort of turned into data through processes of vouchering and um, putting them into into herbariums or transporting them back to to the north and planting them in in um, or replanting them in um, in the glass houses. So this is then kind of signified through these little uh, little plaques, which you'll see, of course, everyone's familiar with who's been to a glass house, these little plaques next to the plants. So this is, um, on these plaques, you have these kind of Latinized names, which are often tend to refer to people who discovered them, which were from the West, um, you know, Western sort of scientific um uh, experts who who were on expeditions to you know the globe to the <clears throat> new world and they would collect and classify and discover these species and so that's one way of well this is the very dominant hegemonic way of organizing knowledge um and botanic knowledge but there is a kind of there's a there's a there's another way of organizing knowledge and there's a, a the, you know this is a sort of challenge if you like to 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 this sort of um this western uh, epistemology which is, um, this was through a particular art exhibition um, by the artist Maria Teresa Alves, which was in a few years back here in Berlin, where she was asked to intervene into the Atlantic forest area of the, of the glass houses. And what she did was a very simple intervention, which was about putting these little red plaques next to some of the plants that had come from Brazil, from the, uh, the Atlantic forest in Brazil and found another way of naming them, and a traditional Guarani way of naming them, which includes a ceremony. You, the, the, the community would go into the forest and they would um, conduct a ceremony with the plants. And the way that they talk about it is the plant ultimately names itself. Um, so it's a very different way of constructing and, 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 and then organizing knowledge. Um, somehow when the, the story goes, when this exhibition was then finished, which was a very successful exhibition. It attracted many, many uh, different publics to, to, the, uh, to the Botanic Gardens here in Berlin. Maria Teresa offered for the Botanic Gardens to, to retain this exhibition permanently. They gracefully declined and felt that actually, you know, it might be confusing between what the real knowledge is, the sort of scientific kind of Western taxonomy um, and this kind of belief system. So this obviously then turned into a larger debate and uh, it's still ongoing. So further levels, we'll get back to these levels now of, of, of how these plants are arranged. What, what's the structure? What's the spatial arrangement? Well, we, what we learned is that the social institutional networks of, of, of the scholars, of the researchers, of the scientists that kind of constitute the botanic gardens is, a, a, is a very significant, you know? So a lot of exchange, it looks like there's a lot of global exchange, but actually much of that exchange was happening in this case in Germanic speaking countries. You know, and one of the other aspects is sort of dealing with the kind of the legacy of previous scientists. So, you know, if, a, if for example, here, the, the amazing cacti collection that the, that the Botanic Gardens has is a legacy of Ernst uh, Leutenberger, who was the former director, or at least the curator. former curator, former curator of, of, the, in, of, the, of the interior collection in the gardens. And he his research topic was cacti. So they had this wonderful collection, which was collected over, I don't know, 20, 30 years, however long he was the curator there. And now the new curator, after uh, Leutenberg has retired, has to sort of manage and deal with this, even though cacti aren't necessarily his particular topic, this is somehow, you know, very difficult to just get rid of these things. So that gives it sort of an indication of like, if change does want to occur, if there is a will to change, 
you know, it's not as easy as that. There is these kind of legacies, these structures that one has to deal with. Then we come down to the smaller level of, say, for example, educational gestures. So um, in this picture here, you can see, uh, I think this is a, an image of somehow a part of the uh, old, uh, the new world cacti collection. And in the quote there, this is taken out of an interview where um, the curator is describing a plant to us saying, well, it looks like a cacti. Um, and if you cut into it, it's got this white milk sap. Um, but you know, okay, this is not a cactus, you know, but it looks like a cacti of the, but it's like a cacti of the old world. So what happens is that you've got all these kind of rules that I've just talked about, but sometimes they can be broken. Sometimes a new world, an old world cacti or a plant that's a bit like a cacti will somehow be placed for educational contrasted purposes to talk about, um, you know, plant evolution, for example, next to uh, cacti in the in, an, in, in the uh, uh, new world. And then finally, perhaps at a more kind of um, effective level, the, the, um, <clears throat> there are some, some uh, there are kind of these, there is yeah, there's this, this designerly kind of um, ability or, 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 or desire or uh, capacity of the curators to arrange the plants well. You know, maybe we just try and play this quick video here because it's quite nice. We can't. Oh, we can't do the sound. We no, turn we yours off, but no, we can. So it doesn't work. Okay, technology failed us. But anyway, this is, the, the quote is actually there. You can see. So if you're quick, you can read it. But um, I'll read it to you. There are there are designers. They really have an eye to arrange plants in a nice way. And well, actually, for me, the most important thing is to plant plants both in a natural way and an attractive way. Yeah, of course, it's kind of an indoor architecture. So I don't know, this was, um, yeah, this was kind of, I don't know, we found that kind of an interesting, I, this is the, the sort of smallest scale of, of uh, amongst all these other rooms, there is this kind of room for, uh, rules, there is this room for kind of these slightly more effective kind of designerly gestures, perhaps. Okay, so then we come back to that overall drawing this then is the, the the way that we sort of have understood the space of the the glass houses you know no longer is it this kind of innocent space that you might walk into and maybe if you've got a bit of knowledge about botany and, and colonialism you might already be sort of skeptical but often and even you know even doing this project now for a few years still walking there i'm still sort of you know it's still a, a nice space at some level it's still an attractive space as, as the as the curator talks about but now we understand really the kind of spatial structures that organize this space, we kind of start to realize that, you know, this idea of, of change, whether it's in, whether it's pressure from externalized um, processes of say digitalization, decolonization, or, or even climate change, whether it's these externalized processes or whether it's just the will to change, because there is this kind of tension between, for example, in the decolonial debate, you know, they, they the garden recognizes that they need to address this kind of colonial heritage. So there's a sort of a growing will, but there's much more um, uh, uh, force being coming from the outside for them to, to address these things. But what we kind of learn here is that it's not so easy to just kind of completely reorganize their, their collection. It's not so easy to reorganize the space. And on top of that, what we learn is, is that these glass houses are protected. They're, they're protected through monument protection status. So, <clears throat> So I just quickly, I'll just check how much time I've got left. Not much, I think. Oh, not a lot. Okay, so I'm going to have to just quickly, like one minute to, to explain this, and then, and then we sum up. Okay, so this was another aspect of the, this was, this kind of, this um, uh, was a study about the, the renovation of the glass houses, which had a different time frame, which was kind of truncated from 1943, when the glass houses were shattered through a bomb that went off nearby, through to 2018, when the final renovation was uh, revealed. And this wasn't a linear process. It wasn't the sort of from destruction to kind of finishedness. What we learned by digging hard into this kind of process and understanding this renovation, it stopped and start. For a long time, it was under... Um, it was deteriorating. Then there was moments where the funding ran out. Then there was moments where the plants died. Um, you know, so time was kind of being accelerated and all this, this yeah, this, there was an acceleration and there was a com compression and there was a stop start process. And then we dug much harder into the real kind of architectural project in 20, 2006 of the renovation works. 
And we learned, we learned about, again, further kind of um, conflicts and tensions which shape the overall space. You know, for example, the, um, the conservation and, and the heritage, what we learned is that, <clears throat> that conservation, biodiversity conservation, and then kind of um, heritage, which is another form of conservation, kind of um, rubbed up and, and contradicted each other. So for example, well, it opens, let's say, another question about when, which moments in time do we go back to? So there was a discussion about whether we, whether when they were doing this renovation of this um, monument protected building, whether they revert back to the original glass house window proportion system of 20 panes, or whether they re revert back to the 1960s um, nine pane structure. And this was kind of a long uh, protracted process, which is not uncommon in, in architecture and design projects. But it, yeah, it starts to sort of be another way to complicate this kind of linearity of time. So unfortunately, I haven't got time to, to talk about Engler's vision. And instead, I pass over to Severine to wrap up. I mean, that's, uh, that was the attempt now to uh, show you what, uh, how would you understand um, hybrid mapping and how it is actually allow us to grasp what we could call refigurational processes. Um, on uh, on the basis of this uh, research project that we are like, ongoing conduct that we are conducting on the botanic garden, um, obviously there is like some limits and reflection to have, and that's certainly also why we uh, sh uh, begin with the um, lecture series. Um, so, what one 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 limit is actually how to make the the multiplicity of time visible. I think we are we, we thought quite a lot about uh, how to make actually the multiplicity of space, but now we are also really somehow in this botanical garden research project, we could see that there is very different temporalities actually um, grounding on and the pining as the specialization of the botanical knowledge there and how to reveal them and to somehow work with them in the maps. That is something that we were still quite um, yeah, looking for answer to do it. Um, obviously, the second second the second issue that we are well aware of is that the mapping that we are producing are are really complex and not really readable. So that how how do you enhance also le the legibility of the map and certainly somehow link to the uh, uh, to the to the last two points uh, that we are also um, quite um, struggling with, or let's say it's just somehow also what is giving us the the motivation or maybe even the motor to to do further is how to establish a reliable protocol for the production of such complex mapping. That is actually to somehow think about trusty traceability of the knowledge that we are producing. Obviously, that's really coming from the social scientific uh, side of it, but that's basically how we can also address this hybrid mapping as, um, or to set up it as, as a methodology and, and how do we make somehow uh, this visible that this um, discovery or this new thinking came from this somehow bit of mapping and uh, and yeah that's linked obviously to the fourth and last limit here and I mean they are, they are much more limit than this but um uh, uh, because we are still producing text um we are working with the mapping as an anal analytical tools but at the end we are still producing text and then it's always quite um yeah a difficulty a challenge to integrate the the map the produce mapping with the text in our article um so yeah, that's maybe like some of reflection that we can take into the discussion. Thanks a lot for the attention.